Hello everyone. What about your mystery stories tonight? Please make yourself comfortable. You can sit or lie down, eyes open or closed. Tonight we are in a cozy library filled with warm, dimmed light. The fire is crackling in the fireplace joyfully and everything is perfectly still outside to entertain you tonight i'm going to tell you about bigfoot or the sasquatch a well-known american cryptid that is to say a creature which existence is not proven nor acknowledged by the scientific community and that finds its origins in folklore and alleged sightings rather than the identification of specimens. After that, we'll go to Renaissance France and I'll tell you about Nostradamus. Maybe you've heard of mysterious predictions made by this astrologer that would have turned to be accurate centuries later. We'll discuss what there is to it. And finally, we will return to America, but this time to the South, and explore the story of the Bell Witch. Don't worry at all, there is nothing frightening or horrific in any of these stories and as always we'll enjoy the mysteries while attempting to take a rational look at them to distinguish what is fact and speculation so let's begin with our first story of the night what is bigfoot and is it real You may call it Bigfoot or the Sasquatch and you may know of the Yeti which is its Asian cousin, we'll come back to that. But you certainly heard of this creature said to inhabit the forests of North America especially in the Northwest which happens to have some of the largest, densest and wildest forests in the United States. But sightings have been reported all across the US and Canada and it seems that the Sasquatch has very old origins, at least as a legend. In many indigenous cultures of North America there were, and there still are for the contemporary ones, tales of mysterious creatures living in forests. Descriptions of their appearance and behavior change. They are not necessarily ape-like, like Bigfoot, but most of the time they had an ape-like or human-like appearance, but bigger and hairier. For example, in California, there are petroglyphs, that is to say, art on rock, left by a group of Yokuts. The Yokuts are an ethnic group of Native Americans, native to Central California. And these petroglyphs show a group of large creatures, possibly in a threatening posture, that some believe to be a group of Bigfoots. These glyphs are estimated to be at least 500 years old, possibly up to 1000 years old, so they were made before the arrival of Europeans in California. And interestingly, among the first European, Spanish settlers and explorers that arrived in California from Mexico in the 16th century, there were tales of so-called dark watchers, vigilantes oscuros, 
that were said to stalk their camps at night. Far to the east, in what is now the state of Mississippi, there were stories in the 18th century among the Natchez people, another Native American people, about a hairy creature in the woods that was known to scream loudly and steal livestock. This was reported at the beginning of the 18th century by a French priest. Yet in another corner of America, in the northwest, the Lummi tribe had a tale about creatures known as Tsemeques, also living in the woods, looking like apes or humans but bigger, wilder, and not necessarily malevolent, but possibly dangerous, so it was better to avoid them. And to cite yet another example, this time from the northeast, the Iroquois tell of an aggressive giant, covered in hair, with rock-hard skin. These are just examples, there are many more across the United States and Canada, and they come from everywhere. They were not necessarily specific or more common in the northwest of the US and the Pacific coast of Canada, which are the regions generally associated with Bigfoot nowadays. Actually, if we broaden the scope a little bit, it could be argued that they are not specific to North America either. Another cryptid that is also ape-like, elusive, and lives in the wilderness is the Yeti from Himalayan folklore. The Yeti is also sometimes called the Abominable Snowman in the West, and it is often described as a large creature, a bit like a gorilla, but standing up more, and with brown, grey or white hair, and large, sharp teeth. It would live in the Himalayan mountains, in a snowy, very cold environment, but it looks a lot like Bigfoot. The Himalayan Yeti is very famous worldwide, but it also has less known cousins in Asia, like the Yeren from China which would have been sighted at least since the period called the Warring States, that was more than 2000 years ago. In Mongolia, there is also the Alma, or Almasti, that would live in the mountains of West Mongolia, and as far west as the Caucasus Mountains. In Australia, there is the Yowi, which comes from Aboriginal traditions, and would live in the Australian outback. And if we are less strict about the criteria, it appears that most cultures around the world had uh, tales about strong creatures living in the wild, stronger and more savage than humans, not civilized, less intelligent, but better suited to life in the wilderness. In other words, larger than life creatures. This has led some ethnologists to suppose that it could express a human need, maybe because of a need to imagine a wilder counterpart, or just because the quick and distant sightings of animals in forests or mountains were interpreted as sightings of human-like creatures because people were checking for the presence of intruders, so they saw what they were looking for. These are just hypotheses to explain that these mythical creatures seem rather universal. Now another thing is that it is established that America was populated from Asia 
and the possibility is that these myths that were already present in Asia, maybe in prehistoric times, traveled with the populations that crossed to North America and then spread to the entire continent, north and south. In any case, there are plenty of mythical creatures whose existence is unproven around the world. The difference with Bigfoot is that it became a phenomenon. It is part of popular culture. People know about it, and well beyond the United States and Canada, and it is probably one of the most famous scripted, together with the Loch Ness Monster. How did this popularity happen? First, because there were a lot, really a lot of alleged sightings, literally thousands in the 20th century. They peaked in the 1970s, which is when Bigfoot was at the peak of its popularity, but they have continued ever since. The creature passed from indigenous cultures to settler populations and all of Americans along the 19th century. It happened locally, between native and migrant communities, but also nationally, because tales from Native Americans were collected, translated to English, published as anecdotes in newspapers, stories in accounts about the faraway regions that were being settled, and there was no shortage of people who said they had seen the mysterious creature in the woods. At the time, the creature was not called Bigfoot. It was not named, or it had several names, one of them being Sasquatch, which is a term of Salishan origin, that is to say from the northwest of the United States and the Canadian province of British Columbia. The Bigfoot name is much more recent than that, and more recent than we could think. It appeared in 1958, and it accompanied the rise in popularity of the creature in the 60s and 70s. The name appeared in North California after an incident at a logging company. One day, a worker there discovered a set of large footprints in the mud that looked human-like, but much larger, 16 inches long, that's about 40 centimeters. He talked about it to his co-workers, and others claimed that they had also seen similar tracks on previous job sites nearby. They also told of weird incidents, like big, heavy objects moved without explanation. The men from the logging company used the term Bigfoot to describe this phenomenon. But they didn't jump to conclusions at all. In fact, they thought someone, possibly one of them, was playing a prank on the group. But the footprints kept appearing, so at some point they contacted a reporter from a local newspaper. The presence of this footprint fitted perfectly the local tales of large, hairy white men. So they told all this to the journalist, and a plaster cast of the footprints was made. Several articles were published in the local press, presenting this as either a mystery or a possible prank but soon, national papers noticed, and they reported the story. As a result of this, the term Bigfoot became widespread very quickly in America, as a reference to a large, wild, and ape-like creature that would live in the forest. This echoed plenty of local tales, 
and the success was immediate. Bigfoot entered popular culture in the late 1950s and 60s. Actually, the American Northwest is where about a third of alleged sightings took place since then. In total, there are thousands. The two remaining thirds come from all over the United States. There were hundreds in Pennsylvania, in Texas, in various states of the Southeast. So, even though Bigfoot is associated traditionally with states of the Northwest, and indeed North California, where the name Bigfoot originated, is close to them, the phenomenon is broader. It exists all across the US and parts of Canada. But the creation story of the term Bigfoot doesn't end there. More than 40 years later, in 2002, the family of one of the deceased workers from the crew from the logging operation came forward and revealed that it was their father who secretly made these large footprints with fake carved wooden feet and that he was responsible for the tracks. So, in other terms, they revealed that it had been a prank all along. But true or false, it didn't change much the perception. Perhaps because this kind of stories in the media falls somewhere between news, science and entertainment. They are exciting as a hypothesis that people take with a big grain of salt but at the same time, they like to play with the thought that it could be real. Now, obviously, zoologists and uh, mainstream scientists in general are not impressed with the story of Bigfoot. They raise a number of objections and uh, explanations that cannot be ignored. First, a creature, an animal, cannot live without a larger population to be able to reproduce. So there couldn't be one Bigfoot, there has to be at least dozens, or if we are to believe the locations of the sightings, which are very far apart, more likely hundreds at least. We would have to believe that a wild species that is present in multiple locations in America, has never left a single dead body, a body part, bones, or even just hairs, that could have been found. Only indirect proofs, like sightings or dubious footprints. That's a lot to swallow. There are wild species with only a few thousand individuals that get spotted very easily when we look for them. And it is not like an animal the size of a gorilla can hide very easily. A second problem is that all large apes that we know of live in tropical regions in the world, in Africa and in Asia. There is no example of apes living in cold forests. They are not suited to their needs. Hair can protect from the cold to an extent but not when it freezes. If you look at mammals that live in cold forests, like the ones of Siberia or Canada, or the northwest of the United States to a lesser extent, and animals that can survive the winter, like bears, they have a good layer of fat and more compact bodies with shorter limbs, they retain more heat, or they are smaller, like wolves, foxes, and so on. An animal with the morphology of a human or a big ape would just freeze during the winter if it has no clothes or shelter under uh, such a climate. Or we would have to suppose that Bigfoots have some kind of shelters or communities. But the fact that none of this was ever discovered makes it maybe even more improbable. 
if they are capable of some kind of social organization, a possibility and a mind-blowing one could be that Bigfoots are in fact hominidae that are thought to be extinct, but they wouldn't be. They would have somehow survived in North American forests. The hominidae are a family of primates. In the tree of animal life, it is a taxon, that is to say a group of populations with a common ancestor. The members of this family, hominids, include different subfamilies of apes and the genus Homo, of which, as Homo sapiens, we are the only species remaining. The science of man and its origin evolves all the time, and especially in the past few decades, when plenty of extinct hominids were discovered, way more than the scientific community imagined 40 or 50 years ago. So, the family tree of mankind, from the perspective of evolution, is not stabilized at all. But what is fairly solid at this point in the origins of man is that the species we call great apes, like gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, are evolutionary cousins. The idea of man descending from apes, with or without a missing link between them, this has been discarded for a long time. Instead, different branches of hominids evolve from a common ancestor. This family, or this branch, this clade, which is another word for the same idea, went into different directions, different subfamilies, or genera. There is Pongo, which includes different orangutans, Gorilla, there's another one called Pan, with the chimpanzee and the bonobo, and Homo. But Homo had plenty of species that went extinct. For example, Neanderthal is a famous one, and one that would have disappeared only a few dozen thousand years ago. But there are many more that have been identified. It is generally admitted that Homo sapiens is the only remaining representant, the only remaining species of Homo. Because of the alleged appearance of Bigfoot, it has been supposed that it could be one such species, like for example a representant of a genus, a sub-subfamily, called Paranthropus. Paranthropus lived, it is believed, 2.6 to 0.6 million years ago. In other words, they would have disappeared only 600,000 years ago. They had very robust skulls, with a shape that reminds of a gorilla, strong chewing muscles. It is thought they were primarily herbivorous, for that reason, but they could also have been general feeders. There are clues that they might have used tools, very basic bone tools, and maybe they could have used fire, it is not proven. They lived in groups, they were social, but their cognitive abilities were most probably lower than other genesis of Homo that supplanted them. Physically, they had big heads, but not big bodies, as far as we know, around 100 pounds for male adults. But apart from the size, they could sort of match the description of ape men. The lifestyle in forests, maybe an intermittent walk on two feet, maybe an omnivore diet, this is all very speculative because all our knowledge of Paranthropus is based on fossilized bones and teeth. So in this case, Bigfoot could be just a species thought to be extinct, Paranthropus or else, 
that would now live in North American forests. But this hypothesis does not really answer the question of why they would be so elusive that no dead body was ever found, or any rest, any trace of settlement. All the remains of Paranthropus ever found were found in Africa, whereas the signs of occupation of America by representatives of the Homo family are a few tens of thousands years old, not hundreds of thousands of years. So that would be a big surprise to discover now that not only did African representatives of Homo reached America way, way before the estimated date, but that on top of that, they would have been able to remain hidden for so long in the forests of an industrialized country like the United States. Forests that are wild, yes, but still not far from centers of population and often visited and explored by people, including hunters or people who actively search for Bigfoot. So for these reasons, the hypothesis is considered a curiosity rather than something serious. This being said, it is also impossible to ignore thousands of sightings or discard all of them as pranks. There were most certainly hoaxes around the many, many testimonies collected over the years. Even believers in Bigfoot admit it. But it is inconceivable that all of them were hoaxes. Some people testified in good faith that they had seen something. Scientists attribute the majority of sightings to animals that would have been misidentified. And most of the time, these would be sightings of American black bears. Black bears are not huge in size, and they can have attitudes that make them look as if they were sitting or walking humanoids. Add to this distance, dense foliage and poor lighting, and they can really look ape-like for a short time. There are even injured black bears that walk upright as a result of their injury, for example to one of their legs. While upright, an adult black bear stands roughly 5 to 7 feet tall, that's 1.5 to 2.1 meters. Grizzly bears, when they do the same, can be 8 to 9 feet tall, that's around 2.5 meters. So at least for the height, it checks with the silhouette, the appearance attributed to Bigfoot. A second possibility is that people spotted escaped apes, great apes like orangutans or gorillas, may escape from captivity and they are not easy to track. It can be from circuses or zoos, but maybe even more private owners. Private ownership of wild animals is quite widespread in the US especially in less urbanized areas. Owners don't always have the licenses or the facilities required, so typically they will not report it when animals escape. Great apes could not survive very long in most of the US, but in the southeast there are huge regions with a humid subtropical climate where, at least theoretically, populations of escaped apes could survive. Now, yet another explanation for sightings could be simply humans. Unfortunately, there were already multiple hunting accidents of people shooting what they thought to be a Bigfoot. At least, that's what they claimed, but it was someone else. In 2017, there was the case of a shamanist wearing clothing made of animal furs 
who was vacationing in a forest in North Carolina. Immediately, alleged Bigfoot sightings flooded in, but it was just the shamanist walking in the forest. This anecdote is rather bizarre and probably one of a kind, but what is more common is the existence of hermits or people who have chosen to live alone in the forest for whatever reason, possibly living on goods and food stolen to local residents. There were stories of this kind back in the 19th century, especially with escaped slaves in the south. They had nowhere else to go and had to live in hiding in forests. In the 20th century, there was, and there still is, a flow of people moving to live alone to cabins in the woods in a search of loneliness or to go into hiding or to experiment a lifestyle. Today, living off-grid is something that attracts people. Obviously, forests are not that crowded, but these are as many possibilities for walkers, campers, or hunters to see something that they can take for a Bigfoot. It can be a bit hard to understand how you can take a regular human being for an ape or a giant covered in hair. But it is not that inconceivable when you take into account the subjectivity of our senses. They receive an information, visual or auditory, and this stimulus is just information data. But our perception of this data is not completely neutral. We tend to impose a meaningful observation on a stimulus unconsciously or involuntarily. Our minds look for interpretations. There's a phenomenon called pareidolia, which is just that, the tendency to perceive meaning or something familiar an object, a pattern, a meaning, where there is known. For example, this is how we regularly see faces or animals or objects in cloud formations. Or, more occasionally, we hear like a voice in a random noise or in music. If this happens to you, you are not becoming crazy. It is a well-known trick of the mind. And that could explain why so many sightings of animals could be mistaken for sightings of Bigfoots, and more generally, why sightings of a mysterious phenomenon, such as this one, can suddenly increase when people hear about them in the media. It would not be just that they pay more attention. It could also be an unconscious trick of the mind that makes them impose a meaningful interpretation on what is just visual information, a nebulous stimulus. So, for all these reasons, the scientific community, and the majority of people probably, believe that Bigfoot is just a modern myth, even though it is impossible to prove that it is just a myth, who knows. Undeniably, there is something appealing in the story, anyway. Not just the thrill of imagining a mysterious species that would live relatively close to us, and a species we would maybe have something in common with. Maybe also there is the same fascination that made our ancestors across the world imagine or believe in bigger-than-life creatures that would occupy the wilderness, like we occupy the areas that we have settled. Now, let's move on to our second story of the night. Let's talk about Nostradamus. Maybe you already heard of him. Nostradamus is the Latinized name of a French astrologer and a kind of oracle from the 16th century, Michel de Notre-Dame. 
I'll tell you more about what we know of his life, that there were plenty of astrologers like him in his century. The reason why he is famous is for a book called The Prophecies. This book is a collection of quatrains, that is to say, short poems of four lines that allegedly predicted future events. There are 942 of them, so quite a lot of material. And some people are convinced that he did predict events that happened since then. He died in 1566. His fame as a kind of prophet really raised in the 20th century. He was not that famous before, beyond circles that practiced occultism. And he's been credited for announcing important world events from the Great Fire of London in 1666 to the fall of Napoleon, the two world wars, the bombing of Hiroshima, or even 9-11. He had a boost in popularity 10 years ago, in 2012. If some of you remember, at the time there was this rumor that 2012 could be the end of the world, because the Mayan calendar announced it ended on that date. In fact, it didn't. But in that context, Nostradamus was mentioned for one of his prophecies that supposedly corroborated the impending end of the world, or at least an important upheaval. Nothing happened, but it contributed to Nostradamus' fame. Let's see what there is to it, and to explore this, we need to return to the 16th century when the Renaissance was blooming in France, but not in a peaceful context. This was also a time of external wars, of wars of religion, and it sounds paradoxical since the Renaissance is for a part associated with scientific curiosity, but it was also a time when belief in occult practices, in witchcraft, prophecies, astrology, was on the rise. Nostradamus was born in 1503, in the southeast of France, in Provence, in a relatively well-to-do family. Almost nothing is known of his childhood, but aged 14, he went to the university in Avignon, a provincial city, but the university closed its doors due to an outbreak of the plague. And in the following years, instead of returning home, it seems he traveled the countryside, learning how to make herbal remedies. He worked as an apothecary for several years, then entered the University of Montpellier, another city in southern France, to study a doctorate in medicine, which he never completed because it was discovered that he had worked as an apothecary, and this was deemed an inferior manual trade that the statutes of the university prohibited. It sounds a bit bizarre, but at the time each profession was very regulated by customs, laws, guilds, and you just couldn't easily change profession. So he was expelled, but it seems he still used the term, the title doctor, later in his life anyway. He kept working, presumably as an apothecary, got married, had two children, but in 1534, when he was 31, all his family died, presumably from the plague, and he resumed traveling to France and possibly Italy. In the 1540s, he started moving away from medicine and toward the occult, 
may be influenced by his travels. We don't know much about what happened because he was not an important figure at the time and his life left almost no trace except for his time in universities or his marriages. In 1547, he remarried, but this time with a rich widow, which established him financially. And in 1550, aged 47, he published an almanac, that is to say, an annual publication listing a set of information about the upcoming year. It could be weather forecasts, farmers' planting dates, whichever tabula data. His almanac and the following ones were astrological. It contained predictions for the year. And that was a popular trend at the time to publish almanacs. He Latinized his name to Nostradamus and was met with a big success with this almanac. So he continued and in the following years he published more. But he did not make only friends at the time, especially among astrologers. Maybe there was envy and jealousy in the response of the astrological community to his success. But his competitors also pointed out that he was a Lucy astrologer, that he frequently made errors and failed to adjust his figures for his client's place or time of birth. They called him a charlatan, basically. But this didn't stop his success. And on top of his almanacs, he wrote a book, The Prophecies, that contained about a thousand quatrains. All these short poems in his book were undated. I told you at the beginning that his prophecies were dated. Because now they are, but the dates were added later, long after his death. This is just one of the numerous changes, rewritings or manipulations that we will discuss later. So the book, The Prophecies, was published and it received a mixed reception. Many people claimed that he was just a fraud or a servant of evil or insane, but several wealthy patrons thought otherwise and in the nobility his fame had grown enough to reach Paris. The Queen, the wife of Henry II, Catherine de Medici, had read his almanac for 1555 and found it well inspired. So she summoned him to Paris to draw horoscopes for her children and advise her that sealed his ascension. It was obviously very prestigious, but it also offered protection from the church, because astrology, and even more making prophecies, was more or less tolerated, but still regarded by many as borderline heretical blasphematory, and uh, this could have consequences. That could be a reason why the prophecies are very hard to understand, very hermetic. It could have been a kind of protection against religious accusations, because it left room for interpretation and uh, the prophecies could pass as poetry. Patronage from Catherine de Medici gave him the guarantee that he would not be bothered. So the last ten years of his life, until he died in 1566, were spent in Paris, under the wing of Catherine de Medici, who regularly consulted him and made him physician to her son, the future King Charles IX of France, even though Nostradamus was not a doctor. After he died, his name went mostly forgotten from the general public. 
There was no shortage of astrologers and occultists at the time. But the prophecies were never fully forgotten by occultists. The book stayed in many libraries and was still studied or looked at in the decades following his death. Nostradamus' claim was that the prophecies had been based on astronomical predictions. But it appeared that, in fact, the majority of the book's contents just paraphrased all the texts of prophecies and omens from the Antiquity and the Middle Ages. That included a successful book of prophecies that had been published in the 1520s, 30 years before Nostradamus' book. If this happened now, Nostradamus would probably be attacked for plagiarism, but this went unnoticed at the time, and it is only in the 17th century that people started to realize, to notice that this text may not have been that original. Most of the quatrains in the original book deal with disasters, plagues, earthquakes, wars, floods, battles or invasions. Some talk about a single person or a small group of persons. They are never identified by name. Another theme is an impending invasion of Europe by Muslims from the east and the south. At the time, by the mid-16th century, the Ottoman Empire was at its peak, and it was a genuine scare across Europe. The Ottomans advanced in the Balkans, in southeast Europe, but they didn't go further, and after that, it went the other way around. They slowly lost ground in Europe until the 19th century, when it is Europeans who colonized the Muslim world. This material was hard to understand and use. But maybe because Nostradamus' prophecies had more echo than other compilations of prophecies from the 16th century, they were republished in the following centuries. Except these republications were not the original text. First, because the French language had evolved, but also to make the book more attractive with the prophecies that seemed to have already worked. So the text was modified and new predictions were added by a variety of authors. Dates were also added. For example, the one prophecy that is often mentioned as proof that there is something visionary in Nostradamus' work is his supposed prediction about the death of Henry II, the husband of Catherine de' Medici. Henry II was wounded during a tournament. A spear broke his helmet and uh, entered his skull. Nostradamus would have described the event and the king's death at this exact date except this quatrain is uh, nowhere to be found in the original edition of the prophecies. It appeared for the first time in print in 1614, 55 years after the event. So Nostradamus never wrote about it, it is a forgery. None of his prophecies had date anyway, as I said before, the dates were added later. So in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, Nostradamus remained a minor celebrity among occultists, essentially in France and to a lesser extent in Europe. But he was never fully forgotten. And in the 20th century, he raised a growing interest from multiple English-speaking authors. Retrospectively, and based on a text that had already been altered in the 17th and 18th centuries, they started attributing him a lot of hits from the Great Fire of London of 1666 
to the rise and fall of Napoleon or the world wars. And they proved as creative as French authors of the 17th century. They added prophecies that were never printed before to claim that they accurately predicted past events. They put dates on the vague announcements of disasters. Another problem is that, according to most scholars, the translations from Old French to English are very low quality, in the sense that they multiply misinterpretations of 16th century words and terms. Sometimes they even add terms that were not in previous texts, and they are also often based not on the original, but on later publications that themselves were not faithful to the original prophecies. This is why critical scholars just argue that there is nothing else to Nostradamus than a fabricated legend based on fakes and oriented interpretations. Sometimes Nostradamus is even credited for having announced something in advance, for example, the uh, supposed apocalypsis of 2012, except you will never see the quatrain where he supposedly said that the quatrain does not exist. He never announced the end of the world. And actually, with these fake dates that were added to his prophecies, the prophecies continue until 3797. So we still have 18 centuries of prophecies left to go. Returning to this 2012 story, it was just a rumor that Nostradamus announced something like this. And the name of Nostradamus was probably thrown into this just for fun or to give credibility to the story. So at the end, what do we have? In terms of prophecies, not much, as I explained. These prophecies were unintelligible for French speakers of the 16th century, and in any case, strongly inspired by past publications. Nostradamus, the man and the astrologer, did exist in the 16th century. Maybe he was honest, maybe he was a charlatan, there could be signs of that in his biography. But there are not enough elements to conclude decisively. What is more certain is that Nostradamus, the prophet, the one that announces events, is a creation that started in the 17th century after his death and continues to be worked on by others to this day. That's an interesting case of fabrication of a myth over several generations, with plenty of contributors adding their little story. But if what you hope to find is accurate and understandable predictions about the future with date, there is just nothing of the sort here. And an Nostradamus that appears in films or is mentioned in novels is much closer to a fictional character. To conclude our little mystery night, let's take a look at another story that also has provided inspiration for contemporary media. The most successful piece being probably the Blair Witch Project movie, which was partially inspired by it. And also all these hunting films that have appeared in the past 20 years. It starts with an account that many consider just a legend written about decades after the fact. And initially it was just part of local folklore in the southern United States. Precisely, it took place in Robertson County, Tennessee. But then the story rose in fame and now it opposes believers and skeptics. So, first, what is the story of the Bell Witch Haunting? 
It centers on the Bell family that lived at the beginning of the 19th century. The father, John Bell, and his wife, Lucy, came from North Carolina and they settled in Tennessee in 1804. The American South at the time was still scarcely populated, very rural, but there was a flow of farmers coming from the East Coast states mainly, attracted by the possibility to settle on land that they could exploit. This is what the Bells did. They built a farm on 320 acres of rich farmland and their family grew. On a small scale, they prospered and became well integrated to local life. John Bell became a deacon at the local church. They had several children, and even though, like most farmers at the time, they lived a bit isolated, almost in autarky for food, they were a socially respectable family for this time and place. This life that we can suppose happy lasted peacefully for 13 years until 1817. In the summer of 1817, things started to change. Members of the family started seeing strange-looking animals around the house. Then late at night, they started hearing knocking sounds on the walls and doors. After a while, the sounds began to be heard inside the house. Sounds that evoked stones being dropped to the floors, chains dragged through the house, and then gulping and choking sounds. But because they didn't know what to believe, that this all looked and sounded very unchristian, they kept the problem to themselves for over a year. Until it became so intolerable that John Bell talked to neighbors, the Johnsons, and invited them to spend the night at the Bell's house so they could hear for themselves. The Johnsons witnessed the same strange things. They convinced the Bells to speak out, tell the community what was happening, and so they did. A committee was formed and an investigation started. More and more people came from miles away to witness this unseen force that was terrorizing the Bell's house. As weeks passed and the phenomenon didn't stop, it seemed the mysterious force was gaining strength. It gained a voice. A weak voice at the beginning, but then stronger, that seemed to come from nowhere. And soon, full conversations with this spirit, this entity, took place. Asked who or what it was, the spirit gave several identities, including the one of a deceased woman called Kate Batts. This name stayed. In conversations, Kate, the name given to the entity, seemed able to reveal secrets from other households that she pretended to be able to spy upon. And the entity also seemed to know the Bible quite well and to enjoy religious arguments. Many accounts suggest that what Kate revealed was accurate, from neighbors' gossips to the place of birth of people. The entity was not mean to all members of the family, but it seemed to be obsessed with two of them, John, the father, and Betsy, one of the daughters. Both were physically abused. Betsy was pinched, had her hair pulled, and was even beaten. John sometimes had the feeling of a stick stuck sideways in his throat. 
progressively, John became weaker, and in 1820, three years after the apparent haunting had begun, he died. Kate, the spirit or the witch, had announced months earlier that she would not leave before he was dead, and she had another obsession, another demand, that the engagement of Betsy with the son of another farmer's family be broken off for some reason. In March 1821, Betsy broke off the engagement, and after that the mysterious Kate stopped appearing and terrorizing them. So there are variants, and I skipped some details, but this is the synopsis of the legend. It is not based on fictional characters, the bells existed, so did their neighbors, and something happened. But the story, as I just told it, was never documented or written about during the events, or just after them. The earliest reference to it is from the account of a military officer who traveled in Tennessee in 1820 and wrote in his journal that there was a story about a farmer's family visited by a spirit that corroborates the date, but there is no detail about what happened and it is a second-hand testimony, he just heard about it. The first known text about this story, an article, was written in 56, so that was 35 years after the alleged facts, and it was written by an unidentified author. In the article, the story was presented as a fraud. The author said that Betsy Bell had discovered ventriloquy and in his accounts, she actually wanted to marry the farmer. The ghost or the spirit would have said that the hunting would continue until they were married, but finally they didn't get married, the engagement was broken off, and the entity disappeared regardless. This article was later retracted by at least one of the various newspapers that had published it, on the grounds that Betsy was too young to create a deception on such a scale, and that it was unfair to accuse her, 35 years later, with no tangible proof. That sounds fair enough. There were a few more references to the Bell Witch story in the 19th century, but nothing major. More than anything, this remained a local story, a part of the oral folklore of Tennessee, with a bit of fame in the South. It was only in 1894, so we are now 73 years after the incident, that a book called Authenticated History of the Bell Witch was published by a newspaper editor. And this book contains the first full-length record of the story. It has become the primary source of its treatment in the 20th century. That's obviously a problem, because the author had not a single first-hand witness, and basically he had to work with two kinds of sources. The rare written mentions about it that were found from the 19th century, but they were all second-hand at best, and the oral tradition from the place where the bells lived. So, basically what he did was to put in writing the local legend, as it was in the 1890s, in a way that may or may not be exaggerated, but he presented it as history. This is why the skeptics look at it as a work of historical fiction, or a fraud, rather than a reliable account. At least it is an interesting folklore study that tells us of beliefs and stories that circulated in Tennessee in the 19th century. 
The truth is, it is hard to either refute or defend this account, because we don't know anything for sure, except that the bells existed, and that most probably something unusual happened at their farm between 1817 and 1821. At the time, people believed it at least. But there are too few elements to speculate about what happened because we don't know what the interactions were between family members, whether they could have been the victims of a prank by someone from or outside the family. We don't know if they had enemies, if there were conflicts in this community, if some people involved had a mental condition. There is so much we don't know. The book from 1894 gives answers to all that and defends the thesis of a real hunting, but it works only if you believe it is accurate, which is at least debatable. In any case, the legend did not end there. In the 20th century, there were several times when rumors spread about the return of Kate to witch. There were several books written, occasional reports of strange noises, like rubbing sounds, piano music, from various locations in and around Robertson County. Nowadays, the site attracts tourists, and uh, there are even attractions that offer visitors the little thrill of approaching the legend. One of them is a cave the Bell Witch Cave, which does not appear in the haunting legend, but is vaguely associated with it, because it is located on a terrain that once would have belonged to the Bell family. This is all for tonight. I hope you enjoyed these mysteries and my take on them. Now you can close your eyes and fall asleep, or pick another story. I'll be back soon with a new story just for you. In the meantime, sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.